Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Mike Hess. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> it's good to be here today. It's good to be sober. I uh, first of all want to thank Ralph for inviting me to be a part of this uh, conference and for the generosity that you've shown, too, about this. And to those of you who spoke last night, I'm sorry I wasn't here. Uh, I was lying in bed and watching TV and enjoying myself, and uh, <laughs> I couldn't decide which to do, and so I... Uh, um, I, I chose that. I um, actually I wasn't feeling well yesterday, and and um, it was actually kind of hoping I wasn't feeling even. I wanted to feel a little worse today. You know what I mean? It was just uh, to, before coming down. And then after hearing the three speakers this morning, it's like this is a bad spot to be in. You know what I'm saying? It's uh, um, Candace is very generous in her words about me, but as soon as uh, as Jennifer was talking and and uh, getting the crowd worked up into some kind of a frenzy. She said, boy, I'd hate to be you and follow that, huh? <clears throat> now, I have a low self-esteem anyway. You know what I'm saying? That uh, th- that just about did it for me. I, you know, Pat, I always love hearing you. You know that. Uh, and uh, if Carl were here, I might say something kind about him. I- I'm never sure he... You know, I... Uh, I live out in Riverside, and for those of you from Southern California, you, you know approximately where that is, right? I mean, it's on the way to a lot of places. Uh, it, it's, it's very much like step six and seven. You, you, you just get through them to get on to something else, you know what I mean? It's a, it, if you're on the way to the desert or the mountains or Las Vegas, you might shoot on by. And I use that analogy sometimes when I talk about these two steps in particular because it seems to me that's what they were in in my early sobriety. They were just so simple compared to everything else, compared to four and five coming up where there was all that big fear about what I was going to write, what I was going to tell my sponsor. It was like, oh, just go home by myself and read a book and then put it up on the shelf and ask God to remove whatever I believed to be defects of characters at the time. No big deal. I, I don't mind doing that at all. Um, I've come to believe much differently. I, this is my birthday month, should I survive till the end of the month. And um, I got sober on May the 30th, 1980, so it'll be 39 years this month, possibly. Um, I'll take pre-approval. I appreciate that, too. Uh, um, and what I would have defined as defects of character initially uh, has expanded Uh, tremendously over the years. To my belief is this, just about every aspect of at least my humanity could become a defect of character at some point. For instance, little things, or maybe not so little. When Pat was talking this morning, he talked about the power of the podium and how he had to be careful with that too. You know, I like being asked to participate in things. I said this at your home group the other night, Hilden, and uh, And it's true. When I get a call from somewhere that that it's fun to be asked, uh, can you come speak? What's not fun is actually doing it. You know what I'm saying? And and the flip side of that, and I'm going to get more into this when I talk, is once I've had some kind of thing that feeds my ego, the lack of it causes me grief. Um, Once I get used to having some kind of special treatment, or at least treatment that feels special to me, the loss of that becomes a defect of character, just like the more obvious kinds of things. Real quickly, I was born in an alcoholic home. I know what those kind of living situations are like. My father owned a bar, and we made our living from alcohol. And before he did that, my grandmother, my aunts, everybody were, were smugglers of alcohol. I mean, I'm of Italian descent. We lived in upstate New York. And they loved to bring in rum from Canada. Uh, they would tell stories about it all the time. And they didn't tell them in a shameful way. They told them in a very prideful way. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and I told this one the other night because I hadn't thought about my Uncle Nick in a while. But it's a true story. And in fact, anything I tell you will be a true story. Um, which I'm not so sure sometimes when I hear speakers. Um, 
not, not that I judge, but just to, um, <laughs> I form very strong opinions. And um, I had an Uncle Nick, and he was in, in my folks' bar one night when somebody bet him that he couldn't drink some type of liquor and, and just chug it. And he did it. He successfully did it and then dropped dead uh, right on the spot. But when my family, including my grandmother and them, would tell that story, they told it with a lot of hope in it. Like, wasn't that a good thing Nick did? Um, <laughs> Nick actually performed like he would. And, and I know some of them were concerned that, no, that nobody ever paid off the bet because we were all gamblers, too, in my family. I was married, uh, I've been married a few times. I'll, I might get into that this morning. But one of my wives asked me one time, um, what are your hobbies? And I, I started thinking about it. And the things that I would describe as hobbies or list as hobbies are actually, in most people's opinion, vices. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because in my family, gambling and womanizing and running around and doing that kind of stuff at least seemed to me as a little boy to be really important, uh, to, to make a person stand out more. The guys in my family, a lot of them didn't, didn't have employment, but they lived well. They had racehorses, they had Cadillacs, they had, they had lives that I aspired to, huh? Now, I usually save this till later, but since it's not a regular talk, after I got sober through a series of things that seemed to be absolutely wrong, I ended up in a career in law enforcement. Um, I've retired twice now as chief deputy district attorney in, in a, of a fairly large county. And I uh, was in charge of homicide, uh, sex crimes, domestic violence, a lot of violent, violent kind of things, things that brought back a lot of my own defects of character as I looked at people. When we tell each other in Alcoholics Anonymous that, uh, that our lives are unmanageable, <clears throat> I know there are a lot of reasons that my life has been unmanageable. One is just certain things in life are by their very nature unmanageable anyway, whether I understand it at the moment or not. But the bigger thing, the thing that's more personal to me about that whole situation is this. Whether it's prior to sobriety or in sobriety, when I view anything in my world, I view it through my own emotions. huh? Either I view it through the way I think it ought to be or the way I perceive it to be at the moment or with some kind of judgment on my own. And those things are sometimes and very often so out of whack that the situation would have to become unmanageable because there's no way that it could be anything different. And I'm real strong and, and supportive of strong sponsorship for that very reason because I've been blessed in my sobriety to have three tough men sponsor me, and they all grew up in the same type of alcoholic back, Alcoholics Anonymous kind of programs, and they all were, had this ability. They were able to listen to me describe to them my poor plight in life, whatever it happened to be at the very moment, and listen without my emotions attached and give me better opinion than I give myself or give me better advice than I can give myself. My defects of character all stem from the very fact that I'm concerned about myself most of the time. For instance, suppose I'm asked to come speak somewhere on steps six and seven, hypothetically speaking. <laughs> and if I were given a choice, would you like to give a talk that entertained the group and made them say nice things about you, or would you rather do God's will? What's the correct answer? I know what it is. Huh? <laughs> I know the correct answer ought to be, I have asked God to help me just be useful today and let me do that. But here's the real answer. I'd rather just impress you. Huh? I would rather get whatever I can get out of it because I'm driven by fear. Jennifer talked a lot about it in, a, in a, her uh, wonderful talk this morning. But the reality is this. I realize that even today... And I do try to work a program, and I'm active in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I do the things most of us do that have stay around here. But left to myself, my major concern is generally dominated by those defects of character. Now, let me just go back a little bit more. I, some of you know this, and I apologize for telling the same story over and over, but it's the only one I've got, huh? 
I didn't start drinking until I was 17 years old. I was in this all-boys Catholic high school for a few years because my parents were smart enough to kind of pull me out of the world for a while and protect me. And I enjoyed it. And in my senior year, I'd gone on this spring break down at the beach. I was surfing in those days. I was healthy. I was, I was uh, generally happy. I wasn't in any relationship, so I was very happy. And uh, I hadn't started dating yet. I went down there, and I came back, and I went to this little party, and I started to drink for real. I don't mean just to sip, but just for a real drink. And I'm the kind of drunk that you never had to ask, has he been drinking? You know what I'm saying? If you were somewhere in my drinking days... I not only slur my words, I look drunk. I act drunk. Uh, uh. I would find this little situation over and over when I'd be somewhere new, whether it was a job or, or with other people. I would usually start out with the quieter people who, who were friendly when they first started at work, and we'd hang out together. And then there'd be like that first party, and I would drink, and I would get comments back from people like, oh, my God, what's the matter with you? Uh, I didn't know you could act like that because I, not unlike you, I assume, change violently when I drink. I can have every emotion known to man in one evening, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and maybe have them twice. I can leave the house happy that I'm going to, going to the party to, to, see, to get some excitement, to have whatever it is come down. And, um, and while I'm there, slip into whatever world I slip into, and laugh for a while, and then cry for a while, and fight, uh, get sick, fight again. I told the story the other night at the Pacific River. I, <clears throat> one of my best friends, I made one of my best friends ever in the world one night at a party because he was saving me from the police as they were dragging me out, and he and I got into a fight, and I bit him so hard that he had a, a scar, I think, for the rest of his life under uh, on his arm. He's a huge guy. And by the way, I forgot to say this the other night. The day that I got sober, well, let me just get to this now. On May the 30th, 1980, I woke up away from home, and I was it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. I was sick to my stomach again like I'd always been. I always had hangovers that were terrible. Uh, there was white animal hair all over my face. I'd slept on this guy's couch. His cat had slept on my head. Uh, <clears throat> I'm allergic to cats and sick, and it was just miserable. And I heard the word from almost every speaker this morning talk about suicide. The thought of suicide was with me on a daily basis. And one of the things I've come to find out from me in sobriety is this, that it never matters really what's going on outside of me. Something about it will eventually make me so disappointed that I'll need something else to make it okay. Nothing outside of me has ever fixed me, and yet I've always believed that it would. And worse yet, I have always believed I know what it is that's going to fix me. And it's either going to be the new relationship or the new car or a move or a change or some kind of deal, and I listen to it and I do it again, and then, I, and then here's the pain for someone like me, a defect of character. I then decide if I hadn't made that, I'd have been happy. There's no winning with that kind of thinking over and over again. And it wasn't until I came into AA when people started telling me, like, it's okay just to feel bad today. You don't have to do anything. It's okay to feel bad. When I was new, when people talked in Alcoholics Anonymous and they were all laughing and sharing and talking about their lives once were bad, then got good, and they seemed to stay good forever, I thought, don't those people ever have a bad day? Don't they ever? I was privileged enough to listen to Chuck Chamberlain speak frequently when I was new, and I even got to spend some time alone with him at his house one day. And I would listen to him speak and he would talk about having a higher power that actually took care of the details of his life. And, and I remember wondering, does he always trust God that much? Does he always understand that everything really is going to work out? Because I don't know anybody like that. And I came to find out that, no, that isn't the secret to people that are active in Alcoholics Anonymous. The secret for somebody like me is this. I know there are going to be times when I can't hear from God when I can't make any kind of contact at all, when I don't even believe anymore everything in spite of all the evidence, and I'm an evidence-based attorney, in spite of all the evidence in my own life, I don't believe it. On that particular day, for whatever reason, that defect is so strong, I just don't believe it at all. And one of my reasons for coming to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings is this. On those days, you do believe it. And even if I can't believe you that day, 
it gives me a little bit of hope that maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Usually you don't believe it, but it could be true. That same summer that I uh, started to drink, I found what I believe to be the best value in narcotic sales. Um, the short version is like this. They, some of you, I don't know if anybody here is old enough anymore. They were called Bennies, huh? And um, <laughs> I'd been drinking about two weeks when I heard somebody talking about getting, buying some, he called them candy. I go, what are they? And he said, they're these little white pills, and you buy them, and uh, you know, they can really give you a lot of energy. And so, uh, and I'll tell it in my very hip language, because I'm pretty hip. And uh, <laughs> I called my connect. Huh? <laughs> and I, honest to God, this is the truth. I ordered a dollar's worth of bennies. Huh? <laughs> And I had this little Volkswagen that had no muffler, and, and I'd, I used to drink Coors, and I would peel the label off the bottle and stick it on the windows so that when the police did pull me over, I could say, why me? Uh, why, why? <laughs> I'd lost all sense instantly. And so on this particular evening when I was going to pick up, I, uh, <laughs> I honestly thought I'd been followed, and I did everything I could to lose the police. Uh, I, I made turns I didn't need to make. I parked in people's driveways. I parked in fields. I turned around. I started over again a couple of times. <clears throat> and it worked. I, uh, I got over to where this guy, Bill, worked at this gas station. And he came running out. And he was trying to literally hide. And he's like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, skinny. He was trying to bend down this Volkswagen, looking around. He said, I couldn't get you the bennies. Do you have $5? And I had one $5 bill, which I readily handed over to him. And he gave me this small aluminum foil packet. And he said, this is called methadrine. Um, it'll do the same thing for you. Um, and then he skulked off because he thought the FBI was after him. <laughs> <clears throat> I swear. And then I sped away to avoid capture. And... Uh, <laughs> Which you know is a lie. You can't speed away in a Volkswagen. Huh? But I, I did floor it, and I putted out of there, and then I, and I, again, I did everything I could to lose whoever had witnessed this crime. And when I opened the packet, when I finally found this little dark spot, I thought I'd been cheated for five bucks. This little yellow-white powder, no pills. He hadn't given me any instructions. Uh, so I put a little bit in my mouth, and I waited. I think I say 90 seconds. I'm not sure it was really a full 90 seconds. I probably waited a minute, and nothing happened to me. So I put it all in my mouth. I had this whole package of shit in my mouth. And my mother used to wait up for me every night when I was out, and so and this particular evening I got home early. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I came shooting through that door. It's like, boom. And uh, my dad was home too. And I'd been kind of sullen for the last couple of months. I hadn't talked to them much, and it was about to change that night. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I talked till they went to bed. <laughs> and then I experienced what I was going to experience for the next 14 years to the day before sobriety. The name of the product changed over the years, but not the effect of the stimulant. I'm in my own home creeping around, huh? feeling about <laughs> as wicked as you can feel. I mean, I, I felt like I was in like San Quentin or something. I was... I neat in my house, my room, the house. I read a newspaper for the first time in my life. And when they got up in the morning, I resumed our talk. It was like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> to this day, I know, I used to think, you know, if I hadn't been so wired, maybe I wouldn't have drank so much. And if I hadn't had such bad hangovers, maybe I wouldn't have used all that speed. And I was sitting in a meeting one night, and I was just, just a few weeks sober, physically sober. And a man named Clint Hodges, who was from Los Angeles, was speaking at it, our, my home group. And I was daydreaming like I normally do at meetings, but I happened to be quiet for a second in my mind. And he said, um, you know, our first step does not say we're alcoholic. Ask yourself how well you drank when you did drink. Because, see, I was debating all that stuff. Am I really alcoholic? Now, I, if I was in a bar and I met some pretty young lady and she said to me, well, you drink too much, 
I think, well, thank you, so do you. You know, because I found that kind of lifestyle to be the way it ought to be. People that ran hard and did that kind of stuff were the kind of people that I wanted to be like. They were the ones having fun. They were the ones satisfying all their instincts. Huh? You know what I'm saying? That same summer that I found the speed and the alcohol and the and the deep music, uh, the rock and roll music, the cream and all those groups playing so much, all of a sudden I'm sitting around in little dark motel rooms with people doing the kind of things that brought me unbelievable pleasure. Every value in my life, if I had any left, had gone by then, except the seeking of pleasure. And sex was a huge one. I'm going to talk about it because it is my primary defect of character, although that's debatable on any given day, which, uh, which one is primary. It was the one that brought me probably the biggest, and other people, the biggest hurts on earth. And yet, prior to Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have said, oh yeah, that's a problem, but I didn't understand enough. You know, when I went to do my four-step, um, my sp another thing I found fascinating today just listening to everybody share is this. There are all kinds of ways to do the steps we work on. Now, I know that intellectually, but it's fascinating for me to hear it from people. For instance, I didn't do a four-step with the columns, the first four-step I did. My sponsor didn't do it that way, and he'd come out of Clancy's group, um, and I don't know where he learned his, but he had me do it a certain way, and I did it that way, and it worked. Huh? It worked for the time being at least. Because I remember being worried when I found out later other people did it in the columns. I thought, well, I wrote mine in a paragraph. M maybe I should do them over again, you know. Uh, and, I, and I went and I did my fifth step with him, and he had me burn my fourth step. I, I have a little footnote. I don't know if it was Jennifer who was talking about keeping the, the, the four steps. I sponsored a guy one time who had the most colorful um, sexual life of any human I'd ever known. I was quite envious, and uh, <laughs> he chose to write it down and keep it in his car for quite a while, and then one day his wife found it, and she didn't know about the other girls, or the other people in general. <laughs> they got a divorce pretty soon after that. I'm not giving advice, I'm just telling you for safety reasons, I was glad mine was burned. Huh? I, I didn't want it around anywhere. Uh, and I was told it was okay to burn it, and here's why. Don told me when I took my fifth step with him, those things are the past now. You shared them with another human, human being, and if you were honest about it, that's all you needed to try to do right now. Now, he didn't say things to me like more will be revealed, because things were revealed. I remember after I'd done that, I uh, had done my fifth with him, I thought of a couple more things I'd forgotten. And I thought, oh my God, I won't stay sober. I mean, I, 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 all those little nickel and dime worries are just manifestations of my own fears. They aren't reality. What I found here is a higher power that seems to be satisfied with attempts to do well. But I know when there's a genuine attempt and when there's just one playing a game, there's a big difference too. I've done most of the hard work in AA out of pain. You know, Bill Wilson wrote that pain is the touchstone of spiritual growth, and I believe that's been true for me more than any other kind of thing. One of the deals uh, that uh, meant a lot to me at the very beginning was we would go around and we would listen to the main, the big speakers. You know, Southern California has been full of them. They're, they're great ones here now, and they're, it's always been that way. And we would go listen to Chuck talk about God. And I remember we were in San Bernardino one night, and I was probably, I don't know, maybe two months sober. And he would come in the room, and everybody would go, oh, God, there he is. And it would be all this hush and all this uh, kind of cool stuff. And, and I could see myself being like him soon. And, um, <laughs> and he's up at the podium, and he says, um, he's always talking about us, about us being God's kids. And he said, I know who you are even if you don't. And I whispered to my sponsor, who, who are we? And he said to me, shut up. Uh, <laughs> and listen. Now, I realized why he did that. He didn't know who we were either. You know what I mean? He didn't know. <laughs> but I found those kind of concepts fascinating because Chuck talked about a higher power that actually 
took care of us, that actually took care of the details of people's lives. And you know, there's that book that was written on his big talk down at the Palo Mesa Resort. And that came about because Lynn Wilder and some of those guys from, from uh, Orange County, Lynn was really good to you, wasn't he? He was my sponsor, died last year. And uh, um, because they thought about it at the last second of maybe taping that uh, talk down there. And he, uh, but Chuck used to talk about the fact that the, the I can't remember his exact wording, the, the main problem for the alcoholic is his feeling of separation from. And he used to say it was separation from everything, from you, from me, from God, from all of it. And the solution, the one solution to all problems was the conscious feeling of unity. Now, I've took a lot of years I've studied and tried to understand some of those concepts. Sometimes I seem to do it better than others. But here's what I believe it means to me today. I can come into an AA meeting even here and feel out of place. Huh? It doesn't matter, matter how many people I know here. It doesn't matter how kind you treat me. It doesn't make any bit of difference because my pain is inside. It really is an inside job. It's got nothing to do with that. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you tell me it's a good talk or a bad talk, although that could add to my pain, so I don't want you doing that. I, I, but do you know what I'm saying? It really doesn't. But I suffer from that delusion that certain things have to happen in order for me to be okay. I have spent much too much of my life waiting to be happy. I'm almost there so frequently. I'm all, that's my biggest defect of character is I'm almost there. You know, I'm always waiting just for one more thing to fall into place or one more thing to get removed. Just something has to get there, and then finally I'm going to be able to breathe. Finally I'm going to be able to just let go. You talk about let go, let God. I'm going to let go as soon as this is done, huh? but right now I'm holding on. I loved the old stories when I was new. It had nothing to do with whether I... It seemed to me everybody came into AA and knew that they didn't want to drink anymore. I wasn't so sure of that at all. It seemed to me... I couldn't even think of a reason not to drink. In spite of the fact that I was going on my second divorce and had thought of suicide again for weeks and was so desperately unhappy I could barely move. I was physically exhausted. And yet, when somebody would suggest to me, why don't you stop drinking, I was so far gone, it made no sense. There was no connection between stopping drinking and feeling better. Nothing at all. And so when I'm hanging around those meetings at the beginning, one of the things I needed to hear was people like Chuck Chamberlain get up and say sometimes he had bad days. That sometimes, he has a, he has a line he used, he said that sometimes praying for him was like blowing smoke up a chimney. And when I heard him say that, I thought, I thought if that's true for him, then I don't need to feel so bad that sometimes I can't make that connection. Here's the danger for me. I don't tolerate pain well. And as soon as I'm uncomfortable, my mind turns to the kind of things that bring me pleasure and get me out of me, and those are usually my defects of character. When I was 19 years old, I met a young lady, and it was great. Uh, physical fun for a long time, and then she got pregnant. And I'm not going to take my inventory up here, but I will tell you this. I engaged in some things that ended up terminating that, and, uh, and it didn't happen just once. Because you see, here's a serious defect of character for me. I will seek out my own pleasure, but then do everything I can to avoid any consequence in my own actions, adding more pain. The one thing I never understood as a young man was this. I couldn't kill my own conscience. I drowned it for a lot of years. I can hide it sometimes. I can stay busy enough, talk enough, run enough, work enough, be successful enough, that I push it away, but the reality is it's like the ocean, it comes creeping back in. And I know when I've done wrong. That's something that's in me that will be in my soul forever, those kind of things. 
And I never knew there was a way to be able to live with that kind of guilt and remorse until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't believe it when people talked about it here. I didn't believe that if you did an inventory and just made your little confessions to each other in your living rooms that life was going to feel better and things were going to work out. But I didn't have any other answer either. I'll tell you, podium people have helped me for years, and they're funny, and I enjoy listening to them speak. And I go a lot to do that. But some of the most significant people in my sobriety life have been people that I don't even know their names at meetings. People who will never be a big shot anywhere, maybe, and don't need it. The real gift of of being relieved of the bondage of self to me is not to need that. To, to, To be able to enjoy good things that happen. I think God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. I bought I believe that's the truth. And I've had nice, nice things happen. But to not need them is even bigger. And I can't get there unless God somehow intervenes in my life, in my opinion. Chuck used to say that we couldn't wish away our own defects of character. That we could. He tells a story about how he got mad at this one little uh, place he was at, the South Coast Hospital, when he walked in there one night. And some counselor was telling people how to deal with their emotions like fear and anger and that kind of stuff. And he said he popped up and shot off his mouth and told them, those are children of the ego. It's very apparent in reading the literature and listening to people share the history of Alcoholics Anonymous that most of the major players that started AA and wrote about AA at the beginning all had one concept in mind, the destruction of ego, the lowering of ego. It seemed to be the key factor, and yet you don't hear much about it too much at meetings. I related more to the people that were successes in business or in in life and in relationships or in those kind of things, which I think is all part of it too. Those Those are the kind of things that attract somebody with my mind. Those are the kind of things that made me stay here and work hard to see if I could get. But I had to be able to get to find out that getting doesn't fix it. It's never going to fix it. But I fall for that all the time if I'm not careful because that is the biggest defect of character. So Chuck used to say, and I believe that most, I believe Bill Wilson found it to be true. Let me divert myself for a moment. Bill Wilson, I don't think, I don't think I've ever read anybody who writes about another human being that I relate more to than he does, than his writings. Little things. He talked about going to that party, that first party he went to as a young army officer and feeling so out of place and feeling so awkward. And he used two words that I, I find very descriptive to this day for me. He said he went into that um, somebody's house and they were, people were visiting and he saw the other folks talking and all feeling part of and welcomed and he felt out of place. He said he felt both conspicuous and ignored at the same time. And I understand that feeling tremendously. That I stand out and yet I'm being ignored and I just want to run away. Because what I like to do is leave. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned is this. There is no happiness in anything when I'm planning to leave it. It can't be. And here's what happens to someone like me. I used to make jokes about it more than I do now. I used to say that I've always suffered from delayed clarity. You know what I mean? Right after any important decision like I do. Uh, as soon as it's done I understand but here's what here's I think closer truth for me that I realized recently it wouldn't matter whether I said I do or I don't I would regret it because the regret is on the inside it's not in the it's not in the details is what I'm trying to say because wherever I end up being I feel that unhappy so I think well that was the wrong choice and that's not true I would have felt the same way if I'd have made the other choice There's some freedom in that kind of thing for someone like me. So let me get back to what my topic might be. I don't even know anymore. I've lost it. uh, Am I really ever entirely willing to have God remove my defects of character? Yeah, when I'm in trouble. Uh, When I'm in trouble, I'm ready to have them go. I would like them to go right now. But when I take them to another, the, the gross ones, the obvious ones, I'm ready to have taken away. But how about this? I don't want to be so prideful that I, uh, that I have to destroy other people's uh, reputations, let's say. 
but I don't mind some mild gossip about them. You know what I mean? Uh, or clarifying, clarifying them to other people who aren't quite as wise as I am about them. I see there's a difference. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying is this. I'm a human being. And one of the things that I find the most gracious about Alcoholics Anonymous is it doesn't ask for absolutes. It doesn't ask for them. Huh? It's okay if I start to recognize when I'm out of sorts and I can ask God to remove my defects of characters because I do it today. I practice that a lot. If you think about it, if you do the fourth step and you do a decent one, the honest one that you can do, and you do a fifth step with, with whoever you choose to do it with, that doesn't really remove anything. It just lays that out there real clearly. Here is what my life has been like, and here are the areas, as I understand them today, that have caused me the most pain. But nothing happens. Bill Wilson and them believed that if you ask God to remove defects of character, they get removed. And Chuck C. used to echo that too. But he said the problem is ego returns, and that's why they return. And when I used to think of ego, I thought, again, like maybe some of you, that all that meant is I thought so well of myself. But here's another flip side of a defect of character that I find truly um, difficult sometimes. I'll go give a talk somewhere, for instance. And it doesn't matter whether it was really good or bad. But on the way home, I'll start to think of my own talk and think how bad it was. I'll start to pick on myself, just like I pick on you. And I'll start to have another lost time because what it all that boils down to is self-absorption one more time. And the only thing that has ever worked for me is when I actually ask God to remove those defects of character. I had to make peace with a lot of things like that. I used to say to God, look, if, your mom, if I'm going to go speak somewhere, please give me the strength not to beat myself up after the talk. I was so shy as a young man about speaking in public that I was terrified to do anything. I would sit with the right answer in class and not give it out of fear. I would go to a bingo game and get bingo and not yell it out. You know what I'm saying? I, uh, I would give it to you because in case I was wrong. I was terrified to say my name and now call it synonymous. When the hand of God has been working in my life, I usually miss it. And when I see events take place, I think they have to be wrong. And let me give, tell you how I got to be a lawyer. After my first, uh, my, my sponsor wouldn't let me make any major changes my first year sober. I went broke, pretty much paying the IRS back and other people that wanted their money. Um, I was selling real estate, making commissions only. <clears throat> my Mercedes was taken away. I was driving a beige Ford Granada, um, <clears throat> kind of a chick car, and, uh, and I was scared to death. And I started applying for work, and I didn't get anything that I thought I deserved. Uh, in fact, I didn't get anything, but that's not the point. And I applied to Orange County, and I told the truth because you told me to tell the truth. I told about my little arrests and stupid petty convictions. I told about my drug use, and I told about my alcoholism. And I got a call from the medical director of Orange County one day, and she said, uh, we got your application here. Looks like you might have a, some problems. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, what do you do about it? I said, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she said, really? Do you have a sponsor? And I said, yes. And she said, what step are you working? Now, luckily, I knew a step, so I said it. And, and she said, welcome. We like people like you. You know, I was grateful for that job. Um, until my first day of work. You know what I'm saying? I'm always grateful at the relief of that. Because <laughs> when I got to work, the boss, there were two of us, said, one of you is going to Newport Beach, which is where I planned to go. That was my life. I was going to go down and live in Newport. And he said, and one of you is going to Fullerton. And he looked at me and he said, that'd be you. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not going to Fullerton. Uh, I'm too afraid to confront him, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in my car and sneak home at the next break. And so I call my sponsor to tell him what a bad break I got. And he said, you know what? They don't care what you think down there. He said, you're going to give them one year, and if they tell you to stand on your head, stand on it. Uh, and then we'll talk about whether you can leave that job. And they had me working with these little gangsters in a place called Tokerstown. For many of you from that area, it's a 
exciting place to work. And, and you know, that year came and went, and I liked working with those kids, and I ended up staying there. And it was a law school right in that area next door, in fact, to where they went to uh, continuation school. And I went over and I, uh, I uh, uh, decided to take one summer school class and immediately knew it was a mistake. I didn't want to be a lawyer. And I called Don and said, I, I don't want to do that. And he said, you know, nobody cares if you become an attorney, for God's sake. Can you finish a class? And I thought, no, I don't believe so. And he, <laughs> he said, just finish. And we did that every, every semester for three and a half years. I became a trial lawyer. I did big trials. I was on television. I've been on 60 Minutes. I've been on every major news show that I'm aware of. I've been on in the LA Times a lot in different newspapers. I've had a lot of nice things happen, which I would have wanted to happen. But my fear would have stopped me. And the only thing that Two things made that possible for the fear to be low enough for me to finish doing the kind of things that, and one was asking God to remove my defects of character. Because I don't know how to get rid of fear today. If I'm scared about coming up here and talking to you, let's say today, how do I get rid of it? You tell me, oh, it'll be okay? Yeah, well, thanks. I'm, <laughs> now, I, now I'm more terrified. I, um, there is There are certain things in my life that I can't handle, and it's I'm glad that there is some answer. I'd rather handle them, but I just can't do it. I have to accept that. And so here's what I have found, that most of the best things that have ever happened to me in my life have happened once I've surrendered, once I have quit trying to fight and push to get my own way, once I've, even when it seems impossible, I shouldn't be a district attorney. <laughs> I mean, you, phew, I am... Um, I mean, I'm sitting on panels where they're asking me to vote on whether somebody should be executed. Huh? But what I bring into that is the honesty that you've taught here. What I bring into that is my own experience. I went, one night I walked across town after being in a fight. I went home and got a butcher knife and walked almost two miles to go back and kill a guy. It was a cold night, too. And uh, by the time I got over where he was, he and his friend were waiting. He had a, his friend had a, a baseball bat. And they both stepped outside, and I reached back for my knife, and I'd lost it somewhere along the way. <clears throat> so if you're ever going to do that, what I would suggest is you have a sheath of some type, and you tie it down. When I looked at somebody who, either drunk or not drunk, or when their defects of character, their jealousy, their rage, their whatever, put them in positions where they made choices that were so horrible. I didn't say to myself, though, they shouldn't be punished because they're like me. What I said was, you've taught me that we have to pick up the tab for our actions. But that doesn't mean I have to do it with anger or hostility. Now, there are a couple cases where I've not gotten to that point yet um, because I go out to death scenes. And I've seen firsthand the way people like me with the kind of rage I have and the kind of anger I have can conduct themselves. And what it's taught me is this. I don't believe God does one thing bad to teach anybody any kind of lesson. When I was new and I heard things that were supposed to be comforting, they weren't to me like this. Nothing happens in God's world by mistake. Now that's a comforting phrase, and it may well be true, but what I took it to mean was everything happening in the world was because God wanted it to happen. I don't think that's true. If it were true, I would not need to ask for my defects of character to be removed because I would be doing everything God wanted anyway. Huh? So here's what I believe. If my rage and anger are strong enough that I can hurt you when I want to do it and I can get away with it, I'm going to do it. It doesn't please God at all. I think God is sad and upset and angry when that happens too. But what I do think the higher power does is this, that no matter whether I have intentionally done something wrong or whether I've mistakenly done something wrong or something has happened to me that's not even involving my own volition, that God will take care of me whenever I ask him to take care of me. That God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free and kind to each other. The thing that gets in the way 
is my own fear and anger, the two primary defects I have. The satisfaction of, of those instincts have caused more grief than anything I can think of in my life. The topic was, was a hard one for me to talk about today, simply because it seems so clear when I thought about actually talking about it openly. It seems like it should take like one second. Yeah, ask God to remove it and then just move on with it. But the reason that doesn't work for someone like me is oftentimes I can't tell what's a defect or character. I just can't see it. You know, I've, I suffer from a lot of delusions in my mind. One of them is, is future thinking. The only real pain I ever have is in the future, the pain I can't deal with. I can hurt right now, but it's okay. I can always handle it. It's the thought of what it's going to be like in the future that becomes overwhelming to someone like me. And so I've got to be reminded over and over again to just stay right in the now. But when my defects of character are flared up, I can't stay there. And so I come here to get what I can't give myself, and that's hope. You give it to me when you share. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.